Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, this is my fourth chapter to which I am going to discuss with you. Today's topic of discussion is Muslim marriage that is known as Nikah. In this lecture, I would like to discuss concept of Muslim marriage, nature of Muslim marriage, inter-religious Muslim marriage and the essential element of Muslim marriage. So, let us start with concept of Muslim marriage. As you all might be knowing that the concept of marriage, I am not talking about Muslim marriage, just to just you understand the concept of marriage is to procreation of children and uh, give an opportunity to male and female to live amicably and peacefully. So, this, this thing uh, here in under Muslim law we will see that there are two things which you need to understand that uh, before the advent of Islam, there were two types of marriages prevalent in Islam in before, uh, before advent of Islam in pre-Arabian society bina form of marriage and ball form of marriage were prevalent in pre-Islamic society. What Prophet Muhammad did? Prophet Muhammad duly recognized marriage and he Prophet Muhammad made slight modification and he said that every Muslim male should marry with a female to whom he wants to give respect. So, just to pay respect and honor to Muslim female, every Muslim man should uh, marry. And in this way, he recognized a different form of marriage that is known as nikah. So, he said that every Muslim husband just to pay respect to the dignity of a Muslim female should marry and in this way nikah became sunnah prophet Muhammad because he himself approved nikah as a valid form of marriage. So, he said that Muslim male should pay something to his wife at the time of marriage and every Muslim should every Muslim person should marry. So, it has two, you see, it has two important objectives. The first is social aspect and second is religious aspect or you can say social aspect or legal aspect. So, so far as social aspect of marriage is, marriage is contracted by the parties just to continue the lineage of that family and second is the legal aspect of marriage is to give liberty to recognize status of the parties in law. So, with the help of this slide I would like to discuss you just look at this. There are two important things Hedaya and Justice Mahmood. Hidaya is a prominent text of Sunni sect. According to Hidaya, Muslim marriage is a carnal conjunction of two opposite sexes, which is contracted by the parties for procreation of children. Justice Mahmud, he is also an authority in Islamic law. Justice Mahmud in Abdul Qadir versus Salima, 
1886 Allahabad High Court. He was judge of Allahabad High Court in 1886. So, in Abdul Qadir versus Salima case, Justice Mahmud said that Muslim marriage is a civil contract, not a sacrament, which is contracted by the parties. So, what he said? On the basis of his observation, uh, it is said that Muslim marriage is a civil contract, not a sacrament. So, let us understand the nature of Muslim marriage. On what basis Muslim marriage is regarded as civil contract, not a sacrament? Contrary to this, you all might be knowing that Hindu marriage is treated as sacrament, that is pious not between the parties and it is clearly stated in textbook that matrimonial not is created in heaven. So, under Muslim law, Muslim marriage is considered as civil contract not a sacrament. So, there are certain reasons for that. So, firstly we will have to analyze that what are those reasons on which argument is made in favor of civil contract that, that nature of Muslim marriage is civil contract. So, with the help of this slide, I would like to justify my argument that Muslim marriage is a civil contract. As you all might be knowing that in a contract there, there is always two parties, one has to make an offer and another party has to accept that offer in totality without making any restriction or without imposing any condition upon the parties. So, you all might be knowing that there must be two parties for a valid contract, one party has to make an offer, another party has to accept that offer in total, in totality without imposing any condition. Similarly, under Muslim law, it is said that there is always two parties, one party has to make an offer and another party has to accept that offer. So, uh, I just want to share that content on screen with the help of that slide you all. I have shown this on this slide you see nature of Muslim marriage, Ezeb, Kabul, consideration. So, you see offer is known as Ijab, Ijab is an Arabic word which literally means that offer, proposal, one party has to propose, acceptance that is Kabul, it means that offer must be accepted with certain consideration and that consideration is mehar in under Muslim law. Consensus ad idem section 25 of the Indian Contract Act 1872, Un it, it must be unconditional. If poor, if poor Muslim male who is unable to pay mehar, he has to read Quran. So, you see with the help of this slide, I would like to quickly highlight each and every component. So, you see Ezeb and Kabul, one party has to make an Ezeb that is offer and offer is generally made by uh, Muslim husband and that offer is accepted by Muslim female. He asks Muslim female to whom he is going to marry that whether she is willing to marry, she accepts, she says that, she says that yes, she is willing to marry with. So, with that amount which is agreed between which she agrees, she gives her consent. So, and you all might be knowing that in every contract there are two parties, one party has to make an offer, second party has to, another party has to accept that offer. Consideration always plays important role in valid contract as I have, a, a, I, I have already highlighted section 25 of the Indian Contract Act. What section 25 says that an agreement agreement without consideration is void. Section 25 clearly talks about agreement without consideration is void. 
it means no agreement would be treated as valid contract if that agreement has no. So, agreement without consideration is valid. Though consideration contract does not consider adequacy of consideration, consideration may be adequate or inadequate in I of law, but there must be some consideration section 25. There are three exceptions in section 25, I am not going to discuss that exception, you need to understand agreement without consideration is valid. It means section 25 also recognizes that agreement must have certain consideration. Here though we cannot equate uh, Meher or Dower is not exactly consideration which uh, is treated in contract, but it is very near to that Meher or Dower is very near to the consideration though it is not exactly consider consideration in marriage, but on the basis of three things offer acceptance and Dower. Dower is what as you here you see one thing Dower is a token of respect which is given by Muslim husband to his wife at the time of marriage. So, every Muslim husband has to pay something to his wife at the time of marriage or even after the marriage. So, that is known as dower and in Arabic word that is known as mehar. So, Muslim husband is obliged to pay something or to deliver some property at the time of marriage that is dower. So, jana means in every nikah in every marriage Muslim husband has to pay something. You may ask or question may arise that whether in the absence of mehar or in the absence of dower marriage should be treated as valid or not or where Muslim female she can relinquish her claim, where she can exempt her husband from non-payment of dower, your answer must be in negative that no. Muslim female cannot relinquish her claim, she cannot exempt her husband from dower, from the liability of dower, because that liability is creation of law, that liability is created by law, not by Muslim, not by the party, not by the Muslim female. Because dower comes in the hands of Muslim female after the marriage. So, before the marriage, Muslim female, that property is not in the hands of Muslim female. So, Muslim female not being the owner of dower before the marriage, neither she can relinquish her claim in favor of husband before the marriage, nor she can exempt her husband from that liability from the dower, because she is not owner of the dower before the marriage she becomes owner of that dower, she becomes owner of that property after the marriage. So, you need to understand that when question is asked, when question may be asked that whether at the time of marriage Muslim female can exempt her husband from the liability of dower, no, she cannot exempt her husband from dower at the time of marriage, because that dower becomes the property of that Muslim female after the marriage. So, after the marriage she becomes owner of the property. So, without you see <coughs> without becoming the owner of that property how she can relinquish, how she can uh, exempt her husband from that liability. So, you need to understand she cannot exempt her husband from the liability of dower. Muslim husband will have to pay something to his wife at the time of marriage. If she if, if suppose if he does not pay as a dower to his wife at the time of marriage, marriage is performed after the completion of formalities, matrimonial formalities, if they are leaving as a husband and wife, cohabitation takes place, consummation takes place between the husband and wife and after the marriage if Muslim husband claims if she is asking her dower 
from her husband. Husband says that dower was not amount was not fixed at the time of marriage, even though you see even though her husband is under obligation to pay her unpaid dower. So, she will have to file a suit before civil court for recovery of unpaid dower and she is entitled to get her unpaid dower from her husband though that amount was not fixed at the time of marriage. So, what I wanted to justify that dower is created by the law not by the party. So, this thing you need to understand. So, here on the basis of these three things is of Kabul and consideration. It is argued that Muslim the nature of Muslim marriage is a civil contract. It is very near it is very close to civil contract not the sacrament. So, only because of these three things these three things are very uh, means it has resemblance with contract is a Kabul and Meher. So, I think you all have understood the nature of Muslim marriage on the basis of these three component it is argued that Muslim marriage is a civil contract to some extent you must remember all these things. Now, come to another aspect of Muslim marriage. I am talking about essential element of Muslim marriage. So, with the help of this slide, I would like to discuss essential element of Muslim marriage. First thing I have uh, written this competency of parties, there must be certain formalities, party must be free from private degree of relationship. So, you look on this slide. So, offer and acceptance there must be certain formalities Ijab and Kabul. You see offer may be oral or it, it, may, it may be writing. Muslim law does not prescribe any specific format that in this specific format offer Ijab should be made. Muslim law only says that Ijab offer can be made in the presence of witnesses or it may be in writing form. If offer is made in writing, then acceptance must be in writing. So, where deed is signed, document is signed by the parties at the time of marriage. So, that document is generally considered as marriage deed. In English, that term is referred as marriage deed and in Arabic word that is known as Nikah Nama, Nikah Nama. So, I just want to explain certain formalities which must be done at the time of marriage. Usually, at the time of marriage, offer is made by Muslim husband to his wife to whom he is, he is going to marry. It depends upon the religion of the parties, it depends upon the sect of husband and wife. Suppose, if Muslim husband belongs to Sunni sect, if Muslim male who is going to marry with female belongs to Sunni sect. So, in order to validate that marriage, Sunni law also requires that at the time of marriage two witnesses must be present one adult male or two female or two adult Muslim male who are sound mind who are of sound mind who are sane must two witnesses must be present at the time of marriage. In the absence of witnesses marriage would be treated as irregular marriage in Sunni law. Shia law does not require presence of witness at the time of marriage. According to Shia law, if Muslim husband is Shia, 
So, if he is going to marry with a female at the time of marriage, Sia law does not require witness. So, even in the absence of witness, marriage contracted by Sia male with a female would be treated as valid marriage in Sia law. So, you need to understand these two things in what respect Sunni law is different from Sia law this is first thing. Secondly, at the time of marriage quasi that is also referred as record keeper, quasi has to maintain uh, record and in that record in that register quasi has to make entry of the day time of the marriage and amount of dower that what amount of dower was fixed by husband for his wife the amount of dower is also mentioned in that register. Register is kept along with that quasi and this is the, that is why quasi is regarded as record keeper. And there is also usually a marriage feast is given by Muslim by father of Muslim female and wakil is also present. Wakil here means agent, wakil is an Arabic word, agent is also present at the time of marriage. So, generally uh, witnesses are present at the time of marriage. So, you see these are the formalities ijab, kabul, offer is made, if it is in writing, deed may be executed, nikahnama may be executed. So, this, this is the first formal, this is the first requirement which must be done by the parties at the time of marriage, offer is made that is accepted dower is paid by Muslim husband to his wife, but the second step which is taken by the parties at the time of marriage that is regarding competency of the parties who are competent to contract marriage. So, I am talking about second component of marriage that is competency of marriage. Every Muslim adult male and female who has attained the age of majority has right to contract marriage. So, question may arise that what is the minimum age of majority or what is the minimum age to contract marriage for Muslims. So, here you need to remember the age of majority for Muslims for the purpose of marriage is 15 years that is known as age of puberty. I will discuss it in detail. Uh, you see with the help of this uh, slide, you can look at this slide competency of parties. I have age of puberty. So, I have categorized, I have classified the, I have classified the age of puberty in three categories, age of marriage in three categories. You see the first is Saghir the second is Sariri and third is Bulag. So, under Muslim law this is the first stage as, as, as you all might be knowing that age of adolescent, juvenile, adolescent, childhood. So, Saghir is the first stage, a child who is below 7 years is treated as Saghir child. So, at, at this stage parties are not allowed to enter into matrimonial pact, neither guardian of the parties are allowed to contract marriage nor Sariri is the second stage above 7 years and below a child who is above 7 and below below 15 years they are treated as Sariri child means at this stage their marriage can be contracted by their guardian. You see what I am saying? Under Muslim law, guardian are allowed to contract the marriage of their ward, the marriage of their child and the third stage is Bulag. I have just mentioned in this you see Bulag screen, Bulag that is third stage of age, a person a child who is above 15 years that child is treated as Bulag in Arabic word and that is means it is considered that 
that child a bulag who has become bulag or who has become adult in eye of Muslim law means he has got that he or she has got sufficient maturity acquired sufficient sexual competence and they are at this stage at the age of 15 they are supposed to have acquired sexual competence. So, at this stage after becoming adult after becoming bulag they are free to contract their marriage means every Muslim male or female who is above 15 year can contract marriage with his or her own choice. So, this is known as age of puberty, age of puberty is that age on which parties are supposed to have acquire sexual competence and that is 15 years not 18 or 21 years you need to understand this. So, at the age of 15 years after becoming adult after becoming bulag Muslim any Muslim who is sane who is of sound mind can contract his marriage or can become party of the marriage he or she may contract his or her marriage. So, this second this is known as you I just want to you see this slide I have with the help of this slide you all have complete under you all would be in position to have complete understanding about option of puberty. Option of puberty here means approval or disapproval of marriage after attaining age of puberty means option of puberty that is known as khyar ul buluk in Arabic word that is known as khyar ul buluk you just option of puberty is approval or disapproval of marriage after attaining the age of puberty. So, means after becoming adult after becoming after attaining the age of 15 years if Muslim husband whose marriage was contracted by their guardian by their father or grandfather when they were minor after becoming adult after getting majority 15 years they either they can approve their marriage or they can disapprove that marriage. This process of approval or disapproval of marriage in Muslim law is regarded as option of puberty khyarul bulag. So, if marriage was contracted by the guardian by father or grandfather at the time of minority when they were minor after becoming adult after becoming bulag they have liberty to approve their marriage or they have liberty to disapprove that marriage. But law is different for Muslim male and female what is law on this point Muslim Muslim husband cannot disapprove his marriage if his marriage was contracted by his father or grandfather when he was minor. You need to understand this thing meaning thereby Muslim husband cannot repudiate his marriage after becoming adult after becoming bulag if his marriage was contracted by his father or grandfather why why he cannot approve why he cannot disapprove his marriage after becoming adult the reason is that father or grandfather they are treated as his best well wisher father or natural father or uh, father or grandfather they are treated as best well wisher of that Muslim male. So, he cannot disapprove his marriage which was contracted by his father or grandfather. One thing is one exception is there unless it is established before the court of law that marriage was contracted by his guardian 
due to fraud or due to coercion if after becoming after becoming adult after becoming after attaining the age of 15 years if muslim husband has succeeded in establishing the fact before the court that at the time of minor when he was minor he was above 7 and below 15 years he was compelled by his father to marry with such a female to whom he never wanted to marry so on that basis he can disapprove his marriage this is otherwise muslim husband cannot disapprove cannot disapprove cannot exercise option of puberty or kharul buluk against his father or grandfather second thing is that muslim female has more liberty in comparison to her husband if in case of muslim female whose marriage was contracted by her father or grandfather when she was minor when she was below 15 year so she has more liberty she can repudiate her marriage even if her marriage was contracted by her father or grandfather after becoming bulag after attaining the age of 15 year she is free to disapprove her marriage if she is not willing to live with her husband there 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 might be certain reason for that where she is not willing to live with her husband with that husband which where her marriage was contracted during her minority when she was minor she wants to disapprove her marriage she wants to exercise kharul buluk she wants to exercise option of puberty even if her marriage was contracted by her father or grandfather she can repudiate and after the dissolution you see up after the dis after the commencement of the dissolution of muslim marriage act 1939 she has got more liberty in comparison to her husband before the commencement of that legislation muslim female had no independent right to disapprove her marriage but after the commencement of the dissolution of muslim marriage act 1939 under section 2 sub section 7 option of puberty is a bona fide ground on which muslim female is entitled to get divorce against her husband if she is not willing to live with her husband she can file a suit for what civil suit for repudiation of her marriage under section 2 sub section 7 of that act if she wants to approve that marriage there are three valid means just i want to share with you if muslim female is willing to approve that marriage by express declaration she can say that she has accepted her husband now she wants to live with her husband second is if she has received dower from her husband so you see receiving dower from her husband will also amount approval of marriage and by cohabitation if consummation takes place then it would be if it would be inference can be drawn that she has approved that marriage and they are living as a husband and wife this is uh, there are three method for approval or approval of marriage so now come to and the important thing that is interreligious marriage uh, with the help of this screen you all would be in position to understand this interreligious marriage sunni sect and shia sect law is different for sunnis and shia as you all might be knowing that law is in many respect uh, sunni law is different from shia law if muslim male belongs to sunni sect so he can marry with such a female who is muslim that marriage would be valid if if muslim male belongs to sunni sect and if he if he marries with uh, uh, such a female who belongs to kitabia community that marriage is also valid kitabia community means is that community who believes that 
their origin is from holy book. So, marriage with Kitabia female is valid under Sunni sect. Sunni male can marry with any female non-Muslim that marriage is irregular. With the help of this slide, you can understand the entire matrix of inter-religious marriage. So, Muslim male of any sect can marry with Muslim female of any sect. Muslim female of any sect means Shia or she may belongs to Shia sect or Sunni sect. So, that marriage is valid marriage. Valid marriage is known as Sahih marriage in Muslim law. In Shia sect, you just look at this. Shia Muslim male can marry with Muslim female, marriage would be valid. In bracket, I have written Sahih marriage, that is known as Sahih marriage in Arabic word. Shia Muslim male can, if he marries with Kitabia female, that marriage is batil wide. So, you would see how uh, inter religious marriage is different in many respect, Sunni sect and Shia sect these two things are different types of marriages. I have just you see I have just uh, referred three things with the help of this slide you see I with the help of this slide I would like to explain types of marriages. Muslim law recognizes four kinds of marriages valid marriage, wide marriage, irregular marriage, muta marriage. I will discuss it in detail before I start, before I discuss this you just you, you look at this the third this slide explains no legal impediments. This is the third essential of Muslim marriage. The first is there must be certain formalities offer acceptance with mehar dower that offer and acceptance must be made by competent party, competent parties that is the second important element which I have just discussed in this lecture. Third important element is that there should not be any legal impediment, impediment here means legal prohibitions, barrier you can say, rider, there should not be any legal uh, prohibitions. It, mean, it means parties must not come within prohibited degree of relationship. So, you see there are three important categories where parties are not allowed to contract marriage with a female. So, these three categories are recognized as prohibited degree of relationship. So, that marriage must be free from legal impediment what is legal impediment? The first is known as consanguinity. you see. The second is affinity that is known as musarat, third is fosteries that and I have also highlighted iddat means no Muslim male is allowed to marry with such a female who is observing iddat. But law is different for Sunnis and Shia. You you need to understand this. In many respect, Sunni law is different for from Shia laws. So I I would like to discuss one by one. Consanguinity is blood relationship that is known as kurabat in Arabic. A word kurabat. So no Muslim male is allowed to marry with uh, his mother's daughter or sister or sister. So in blood relationship, Muslim male is not allowed to marry. That is absolute prohibitions. Marriage contracted would be wide. Absolute prohibitions, relative prohibitions. There are two types of prohibitions: absolute prohibitions and relative prohibitions. In absolute prohibitions, the consequence of that marriage would be wide. Affinity, musharat. That is known as means. Musharat, relationship by marriage. The relationship which is established by marriage, even that means Muslim, for example, Muslim male is not allowed to marry with 
his mother in law. So, marriage because now that relationship has been established by marriage. Third is fosterage. Fosterage here under Muslim law, it is believed that where a child below the age of 2 years has sucked the milk from any female that that female is treated as foster mother and that female is as good as his real mother so a child who has sucked milk from a mother from a female when he was below 2 years so he that muslim male is not allowed to marry with that female or the child or daughter of that female because that female has become foster mother that is known. So, so foster is that is also prohibited in Arabic word that is known as Riza. So, I think you all have understood these three categories where parties are not allowed to marry and the prohibition and the kind of impediment where parties are not allowed to contract their marriage that is Iddat. Well, so I am talking about legal impediment, prohibited degree of relationship, where parties are not allowed to contract marriage due to certain uh, things, due to certain prohibitions. So, as I said, there are two important prohibitions first is absolute prohibitions, and second is relative prohibitions. So, absolute prohibitions impediments prohibits absolutely and relative prohibitions may uh, allow the party to go to some extent it meaning thereby in absolute prohibitions parties are not allowed. So, I, I, I have already highlighted Musharat, Mubarat and Riza these are three absolute prohibitions where Muslim male cannot marry and second is relative prohibitions. So, under Sunni sect relative prohibitions means relative prohibitions are allowed. Sunni Muslim male can contract marriage with such a female who is observing it that if he if he marries with such a female who is observing it that he belongs to Sunni sect. So, under Sunni law that marriage is irregular. So, how and you see irregular marriage is as good as regular marriage. It is irregular because of some irregularity and after the removal of irregularity that marriage may be treated as irregular marriage. So, this Iddat as I said Iddat literally means counting of days as I said you I just want to briefly explain this concept Iddat. Iddat was recognized by Islamic scholars in order to avoid any kind of doubt for ascertaining the legitimacy of a child. So, where marriage is dissolved either by death of husband or by divorce talaq, Muslim female should observe iddat means she should live pure life simple and pure life during that period she is prohibited to marry with any male or she is prohibited to live simple and pure life. So, that so that paternity of that child if she was conceived uh, she was pregnant at the time of death of her husband or if she was pregnant at the time of talaq. So, it would be very difficult to ascertain if, if she would have been allowed to marry it would be very difficult to determine the paternity of that child. So, for that reason this concept was evolved and for this reason Muslim female is prohibited to to contract marriage with any male before the expiry of Hiddat period. So, with this objective this concept was recognized in Islam 
and to some extent this is good for the betterment of Muslim female as well as husband who has given divorce to his wife. But date you see days are different, there are different methods to calculate this either period as I have already highlighted in this how this period is counted and uh, you just can remember these all these things where divorce is given, talaq is pronounced, divorce is given to Muslim female. In that case, she will have to observe with that up to 3 months where Muslim husband dies. In case of death of husband, she will have to wait up to 4 months 10 days. After the expiry of 4 months 10 days, she can marry. Before that, she is not allowed to enter into matrimonial pact. And in case of pregnancy, if she was pregnant at the time of death of husband or so in the in that case, this iddat period would be extended up to the delivery of child. So, you see law is different for Sunnis and Shia with respect to iddat. In Shia law, marriage contracted with a female who is observing iddat would be void. On the other hand, in Sunni law, marriage contracted with such a female who is observing in the that marriage is irregular. After the removal of irregularity, that marriage will be treated as a regular marriage. So, this is different between these two. So, now come to this, this is all about your essential element of marriage, Nika. The first element is formalities, there must be certain formalities by the parties. Second is competency of parties, third is there should not be any legal impediment. Marriage must be free from legal impediments, parties must not come within prohibited degree of relationship. Now come to this types of marriage, as I have highlighted there are four types of marriages you and consequences of these four types of marriages are totally different. First is valid marriage, in Arabic word this is known as sahih marriage, wired, batil, irregular marriage, fasid, muta marriage, this is fourth kind of marriage. So, uh, I would like to discuss one by one. So, where Muslim male has contracted marriage with such a female who is Muslim, either he belongs to Sunni sect or Shia sect, that marriage would be treated as valid marriage. And what would be the consequences of valid marriage? Muslim female is an invalid marriage, in Sahih marriage, Muslim female, Muslim married women is entitled to get maintenance from her husband. So, right of maintenance is available to her. She is also entitled to get full amount of dower, which was not paid by her husband at the time of marriage. So, right of dower is also in the hands of Muslim female, where marriage is valid. She is also entitled to inherit the property of her husband after, her, after the death of her husband. Rule of inheritance is also applicable. She is also entitled to get, get maintenance for her child or children from her husband. So, you see these are the consequences of valid marriage. Children are treated as legitimate, cohabitation is lawful, children are legitimate, children are entitled to get maintenance from his, from his father or from uh, their father. And Second important thing is that in valid marriage, Muslim children they are entitled to get inheritance, they are, in, they, are, they are entitled to inherit the property of his father after, after the death of his father. So, rule of inheritance is also applicable. Now, come to irregular marriage. 
you need to understand that irregular marriage is only recognized by Sunni sect, not by Shia law. So, one point that is very clear and uh, which you need to understand only Sunni sect recognizes irregular marriage, Shia sect does not recognize irregular marriage. So, irregular marriage is as good as regular marriage, it is referred as irregular marriage because of some irregularity. After the removal of that irregularity, marriage can be regularized. For example, Islam permits that any Muslim male can have four wives at a time. Any Muslim male can have four wives at a time. Vice versa is not true. So, if any Muslim male, if any Sunni Muslim male contract marriage with fifth female, so marriage with fifth female is irregular. You just you, you see, you just remember this thing. Marriage with fifth female is irregular in Sunni sect. On the other hand, marriage with fifth female is wired, wired marriage, wired ab initio marriage in Shia law. Shia law does not permit to a Shia male to contract fifth marriage. So, that marriage would be wired in Shia law and it would be irregular in Sunni sect. How, why it is irregular? Because it is only it is only an irregularity. After the removal of that irregularity, marriage can be regularized. How that irregularity can be removed by that Sunni Muslim male? By giving divorce to any one of four female, that marriage can be regularized. So, where Sunni male has contracted marriage with fifth female, by giving divorce, by giving talaq or divorce to any, any one of four wives, he can regularize that marriage. And after the removal of that marriage, it is believed that, it is believed by Sunni Muslims that now irregularity has been removed. So, that marriage would be treated as valid marriage. So, this is the example of irregular marriage. There are, you see, the fourth types of marriage which I have referred that is muta marriage. Muta marriage is a very peculiar form of marriage which is recognized by Ithna Isharia Shia Muslims. As I said, Shia sect has three important ideology, Jayadiya school, Ismailiya school and Ithna Isharia school. Only one ideology, only one school, Ithna Isharia school recognizes muta marriage. Muta marriage that is temporary marriage, that this is muta is an Arabic word which literally means temporary or marriage for pleasure. So, this concept was recognized by Ithna Isharia school and they have given justification for recognition of this marriage. What, what kind of justification? They recognize this marriage on that basis when Muslim male men, they had to live away from their homes either for business purposes or for trade purposes, they had to live away from their homes. So, there was possibility that Muslim men they could uh, involve in evil practices like prostitution. So, it was decided by Itna Isariya is Islamic scholar that when Muslim men who used to go for war purposes or who had to live away from their homes, so they were allowed to contract marriage for a specific period. So, in muta marriage, marriage can be contracted for a day, for a month or for a year. 
so date time must be specified by the by the parties if time is not specified by the parties then inference would be drawn in favor of regular marriage nikah and marriage would be treated as regular marriage and all the benefits would be given to the muslim female which muslim female can get in regular marriage so you need to understand that in muta marriage mar the time must be specifically specified in the document that for which specific period they have contracted this marriage marriage may be for a day for a week for a month so specification of time is necessary for muta marriage and the most important thing is that and i think that you all must have understood this muta marriage what literal meaning of muta marriage concept of muta marriage logic behind recognition of this muta marriage and you see all the ingredient even in muta marriage offer is made isab is made by one party and that is accepted kabul is made by another party dower is paid that amount is paid by one party muslim husband at the time of marriage all the formalities which which are necessary for a regular marriage that must be fulfilled by the parties even in muta marriage so the muslim husband is also obliged to pay something to his wife at the time of marriage so this is all about your types of marriage and the most important thing which i have just written on the screen the special marriage act 1954 you all need to understand that where parties belong to muslim uh, where muslim husband and wife where muslim male and female both are willing to contract their marriage under the special marriage act 1954 that is popularly known as court marriage so if muslim has if muslim husband is willing to contract marriage with such a female who is also muslim but they have decided to contract marriage in accordance with the provision of special marriage act 1954 and once my once marriage is registered in the presence of registrar marriage in the in the presence of registrar before the competent authority marriage is contracted under this act so irrespective, <coughs> irrespective of the caste and creed irrespective of the religion of the parties they would lose their rights under muslim law meaning thereby muslim female who has contracted her marriage in accordance with the provision of special marriage act 1954 she would get nothing from her husband under is under muslim law because it is the marital status of the parties which will deprive her from the benefit of muslim law so see if marriage is contracted in this accordance with uh, with this act the inheritance rule would not be muslim rule of inheritance of muslim law would not be applicable in that in this case the rule of indian succession act 1929 would be applicable though both part both parties belong to muslim uh, islam both parties are muslim but since they have contracted their marriage in accordance with the special marriage act they will lose their right in their personal laws so muslim female is entitled to get the benefit of section 125 crpc because she has contracted marriage under this act and muslim female would get nothing from her husband under muslim personal laws so this is all about your marriage nikah essential element of marriage types of marriage muta marriage iddat so all i have covered each and every aspect of regular marriage and i do believe that you all have understood the things which i have just discussed in this lecture so with this i would like to conclude this lecture thank you